have open and honest discussions about that, I would hope, under a Trump administration, without it turning into just finger-pointing and Islamophobia and xenophobia and all the other things that are trotted out there. Uh, team, I've got a lot more. 888-900-3393 on those phone lines. Be back in just a few. Buck Sexton. The Blaze Radio Network. You know, I should probably go check out some of these movies that are out that people say are really good. Uh, I I don't usually talk to you that much about movies here on the show, but um, Ms. Molly saw La La Land, said it was great. But if I was going to see that one, I think I because isn't uh, the Oscars are coming up pretty soon, right? So, um, but yeah, uh, La La Land is supposed to be. A good movie. I, I'm usually not a musical person, though. I, I just generally can't get excited about watching a, a musical. It's just not, not in my, in my, uh, in my, in, not in my wheelhouse. We could put it that way. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, and you know, even sometimes a cartoon musical, I will make exceptions for Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast. Uh, but the movie Arrival is um, also supposed to be really good. I've heard that that is. That is excellent. So I'm thinking about checking that one out, too. And then I know there's a movie called The Dog's Purpose, which I have not seen. Um, but I feel like we all know what A Dog's Purpose is, right? I hope you all enjoyed the part of the show yesterday where we talked about Pitbull. Fascinating to me that there's such a, a hot – people get really invested in that because, look, I, I understand, right? If you love your dog and if especially you love your dog and it's a Pitbull, you don't want to hear – people saying that the breed is a danger and that they're bad and uh, but very very fierce de- debate and discussion on that one and it is interesting to me because it does sometimes mirror some of the language you'll hear in the in the gun debate right? it's about being a response you, know, you can be a responsible gun owner you can be a responsible pit bull owner both can be dangerous under the wrong circumstances I- i'm not saying these are the same discussions i'm just saying that you the way that it gets Framed because you, you, you the news reports are about irresponsible pit bull owners usually or people that are using pit bulls for illicit purposes, but of course most of the time a vast majority of them are safe and cute and friendly and everything is is fine. So uh, the the dog discussion very quickly turns into a uh, that gets that gets politicized uh, that gets uh, people really really fired up when it comes to pit bulls i've always found i find that uh, doberman pinchers put me a little bit more on edge there's just something dobermans look a little scary I, i've met sweet dobermans so you don't have to send me an email telling me that dobermans are great i, I know i'm i'm aware but dobermans I, i've always thought that rottweilers well i know they're also very powerful and, and can be a dangerous rottweilers are kind of cute and i've always liked i've always been kind of a rotty fan uh, people like Roddy's a lot. I did not know until we found out yesterday with our expert on the show that uh, German Shepherds were number one in the bite department. That was something of, of a surprise to me. I, I did not think that that was like, – I would have thought it was pit bulls, quite honestly. Uh, and there are so many of them. Whenever I go on these sites – and I've gone on these sites a little bit. Whenever I go on these sites to check out uh, what's available for adoption, if you are willing to adopt – uh, a pit bull or even more so a mixed pit we, we do we not we, i don't think we say mutt anymore right a mixed a mixed breed dog that's what we're supposed to say or uh I, i'm not even sure what the proper terminology there if it's a fancy mix then it's a designer dog like a a, a a cockapoo or something like that is that a isn't that what a cocker spaniel and a poodle or uh, the, and the, the obamas had a um what uh they had a i forget what it was what it was called a where it was a Portuguese water dog. Oh, no, that was a purebred. But there are people like these these dogs that are, some of them are hypoallergenic, which I know gets them, it gets everyone excited. But anyway, I'm thinking one day, team, one day I'm going to get a dog. I'm going to make it happen, hopefully sooner rather than later. I got a few things on the plate. Got to get a dog. Got to, like, try to get engaged at some point. You know, that would be nice. Maybe even some little, little bucks. Uh, but I digress. Wow, what a huge digression. 
Uh, so, yes, dogs, pit bulls, movies, you know, fun stuff to talk about. We'll hit that and more. Uh, if you want to give me a call before we close up shop today in the Freedom Hut, please do. 888-900-3393 is the number. Be back in just a few. This is the Buck Sexton Show. The Blaze Radio Network. Sexton Show. Speak your mind. 888-900-3393. I know that there are divergent uh, opinions on this one, but I get very uncomfortable when we start to see what we think of as Internet platforms playing the role of speech police. You're going to see much more of this in the months and years ahead. You're going to see a lot of of this stuff underway. Um, And Google, according to this uh, piece that I see on linked on the Drudge Report, Google has banned 200 publishers since it passed a new policy against fake news. Um, So now they're, the company has weeded out bad ads in the past. Now it's weeding out bad publishers. This is fascinating because Google is a private company. And so as good liberty-loving conservatives, we do have to keep in mind that Google is not a public utility. So they can have the procedures and policies in place that they want, of course, within the boundaries of law, but they can create codes for codes of conduct that involve, you know, don't be mean to people and don't harass people. They can do all that stuff, and they're totally allowed to. Uh, and this is... Uh, with the whole uproar over fake news, um, I think that there is there is pressure, real pressure at the very top of Google, Yahoo, and these other sites, Facebook. Facebook's a huge one. To decide that certain publishers are just making up fake stuff and to get rid of it. Now, this is fascinating because, first of all, where, what do you do when someone starts to claim that this is or that their information is a form of parody? Uh, well, what do you do when all of a sudden... Someone is wrong sometimes, but right other times, or they're putting out theories that seem conspiratorial. Maybe they are conspiracy theories, but they're right once in a while. I know they have um, they have guidelines now for what they're considering to be fake news. But the opportunities here for this to become political are enormous. And I just see this as a continued evolution of what we were dealing with in the past. Look, this is before my time, although my lifetime has really coincided with the growth of alternative media in the sense of half the country having their views represented in the media uh, on the right. Nineteen, I was born in 81, so over the course of my life, Rush and the 90s and the Internet and then Fox News and then all the other conservative sites that have popped up along the way uh, and, and channels here and there, too. They offer an alternative, but for a long time, the narrative was completely dominated by one side. For a long time, there was really no answer that the other side could come up. I mean, sorry, there's really no answer to what the other side was putting out there. And there was, in a way, a monopoly on the perception of the American people that ABC, CBS, NBC, and NPR, and some other long-standing legacy media outlets had. Now, the Internet, of course, created a change in that model, and it's a change that is becoming more and more apparent with each passing day that these huge social media platforms are increasingly where, especially younger people, are getting their news, um, and this is what they're turning to to find out what's going on in the world. And so whereas the monopoly before was on newspapers and TV channels, radio, of course, was the outlier, which is why they want the fairness doctrine. There have been all these attempts in the past to try to rein in conservative radio because the left has recognized for a long time that, yeah, conservative radio is a really powerful tool 
to counter the narratives that other than radio they've had a a dominant hand in for such a long time. Anyway, the Internet really ended the stranglehold, along with Fox, but the Internet ended the stranglehold that the left had on the narrative. And, of course, the left has become more left now. You know, Democrats in the 60s and 70s, you look back at a speech that JFK would have given, and the members of the, there were at least people who were in the Democratic Party that had much more traditional values and much more comfortable with words like patriotism and all of that than what you have today. I mean, today you have this globalist, far-left, progressive party that is is pushing for an internationalism above patriotism and a, a much broader, longer discussion to have another time. But it's a change. The Democratic Party has changed, has gone hard, has gone hard left, uh, particularly in the era of Obama. But the Internet allowed there to be all this competition among all these different sites, right? So you ha- you could set up a blog, and if a lot of people read it, well, then you're a successful blog, and you go from there. And a website that was doing a good job with its news coverage could compete. Well, if you can have bottlenecks now created by search engines, if search engines are in a position uh, to decide that some people are just coming up with completely fake stuff and other people are, um, you know, getting away with a little bit of shenanigans here and there, uh, now you have a sort of return to the old model. It's going to be a lot harder. If Google and Facebook, uh, I know right now they're saying it's fake news, but look at the effort to say that Breitbart is alt-right. And alt-right meant something different when Breitbart was publishing stories by those who were deemed to be in some way connected to the alt-right. Alt-right has been really uh, largely subsumed or appropriated into the Robert Spencer white nationalist movement. But I, as I've talked to you before on the show, that wasn't always what alt-right meant, or at least that wasn't always what people who thought they were alt-right were subscribing to and were involved in. But you could very easily see a situation in the future where a site that the left hates, like a Breitbart, if there are enough complaints about it, or they say that it's advancing white supremacy. I mean, you just have to look at the verbiage used by the left you know, opposition to uh, affirmative action more or less means that you're, you know, a, a terrible person. You're the equivalent of a Nazi. You're a racist. You're evil. Uh, you look at the way that the left frames a lot of these discussions and news sites that you and I would think of as being completely within the bounds of legitimate discourse and you know, completely acceptable for public consumption may get caught up in. These new rules set up by these behemoths that have a largely monopolistic control over the flow of information over the Internet. So and I do think the left sees this as a way to regain that power, to direct the conversation, to determine what is acceptable and, and what is not even for people to read at all. It's paradoxical, right? There's a new censorship that comes from all of this originally the internet was an explosion of information for everyone to see and so much of it was free and that's still all true of course and the internet does more and is more important with each passing year but i think we're also seeing now that there are realities of the web that we don't always take into account we're having these discussions about how everything is now freed up and it's a flat it's a flat uh, com- competitive field and the marketplace of ideas and all that other stuff you look at a Google, when someone Googles a word or they're looking for something, whatever's on that first page in that Google search is everything. People rarely go to the second page and definitely even more rarely go to the third page. So whatever comes up right away on Google is an, is an immensely powerful statement about that subject matter because Google gets to determine what is there. And they say they have this algorithm, but they're clearly tweaking the algorithm and they have the ability to prevent certain sites and publishers from popping up, they're just going to get better and better at that. And some of the most successful news websites, in fact, spent a tremendous amount of resources and time trying to find ways to game SEO, search engine optimization, so that they could get better rankings, essentially be on that front page of Google or Yahoo or any of the other ones. I remember there was like Ask Jeeves for a hot second. I don't even know if that's still a thing. Uh, Ask Jeeves was a website. Uh, I think Dogpile was a 
a search engine that existed for a little while. There have been a, a whole bunch of these over the years that have uh, faded away.